7 o'clock. Hello, welcome everybody, and uh, those of you who were willing to come out on a cold and wet night, I appreciate you, and uh, I think we've got a good, a good chapter before us tonight. Before we dig in, though, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, as always, we are so grateful for your word. You have given us a wonderful gift, and we are we are eager, Lord, to hear what you have to say to us through your word tonight. Send your Holy Spirit to bless us and to give us enlightenment, Lord. Illumine us. Give us wisdom. Help us to receive all that you have to give. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So continuing in the Gospel of John, last week uh, Jesus went to the Feast of Tabernacles uh, that great fall festival on the Jewish calendar, and he talked about the gift of living water that he has to give. Today, we're going to see the flow of that interrupted by a problem passage, and we're going to talk about the problems around this particular passage. This is one of the big questions that you find in the gospel of particular passages that are disputed, and uh, then we're going to resume the conversations that we've been having about Jesus and his identity, uh, the, the discussions he has with the religious powers that be about how he has authority to do what he does and say what he does, his relationship with his father, we're going to get back into all of that, and in the process, Jesus is going to give several of those verses that you probably already have committed to memory, such as, I am the light of the world, or you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And at the end, before Abraham was, I am. So it's going to be a lot of high points here. But first, let's read chapter 7, verse 53, through chapter 8, verse 11. And uh, who would like to read that little passage? Thank you, Sandra. <coughs> they, went, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman, a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone, stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But then they, when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Okay, so we'll stop there for a little bit. Um, I'm not sure what uh, notes you have in your Bibles there, but I've got a little heading, the <laughs> earliest manuscripts. Do not include chapter 7, verse 53 through 8, 11. Uh, the Bible I use at home. Put this. Did you have a question? I couldn't figure out the word, sorry. Oh, okay. I couldn't find 53 and 8. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, 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 it's a it's bad weird. chapter break. The guy who did it, he, he messed up there. Um, yeah, the Bible I have at home puts this whole passage in uh, italics. Uh, there's probably a big footnote there. The reason is this is not in the oldest manuscripts that we have of the Gospel of John. And so the question then is, how do we deal with a passage like this? There's one other big passage. It's the end of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we talked about that when we studied Mark. The oldest manuscripts cut off halfway through chapter 16. 
Um, so there's a question as to what happened. Um, in a few of the oldest manuscripts, there's actually a space at this point, which is suggestive, but it's hard to argue from silence. Um, but a few have speculated, was this originally in and then taken out? Maybe because it looks like Jesus is being soft on adultery. No. He's not, by the way, but, you know, maybe. Um, the other interesting fact about this passage is when this piece was put in or put back in, depending on what view you want to look at, it's not always put here. Some manuscripts have this in chapter 7, some have it after chapter 21, and there's even a couple that put it in Luke. Oops. Um, so that's why most English Bibles that I've ever seen have some kind of note here, just to let you know, or put it in italics. I have some friends that will never preach on this passage. They say hey, there's nothing wrong with it, but they don't consider it having the same level of authority as the rest of the Gospel of John. Um, but when you look at it, and I know this is somewhat subjective, um, there is warrant for these events that something like this actually did happen with Jesus. Um, when they translated the Bible into Latin, uh, a book that Jerome translated, it was called the Vulgate because it was translated into the vulgar language of the time. At that time, vulgar meant common, every day. The normal people spoke, so the vulgar language, that word later came to be coarse. You understand what I'm saying here, but the Vulgate, it's called. Um, we also have this quoted from a book in the third century. Um, church historian Eusebius tells us that a man named Church Father Papias told this story and he lived around the year 100, so we're getting really close to the time of the apostles to give warrant that this actually happened or something like it. Um, and honestly, doesn't it feel like Jesus? Yes. You know, when you read other extra biblical writings, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, and some of the other writings, it's not the Jesus that I know. You know, Jesus is doing outlandish things. There's the, there's some nativity stories of Jesus getting mad at a friend and turning him into a bird. No. You know, and it's, no, I really don't think Jesus killed one of his friends when he was a child. I'm sorry. I'm just going to go out on a limb. Um, so this feels right, and it's consistent with what we know from other Gospels. We know they were trying to trap him, sure. right? And we know that he found ways to get out of those traps that were really ingenious, like he does here. So it's subjective. It's a problem. We're not going to solve it tonight because nobody solved it in 2,000 years. But there you go. But like I said, we've got a trap, we've got a test here by the scribes and Pharisees. They bring to him a woman who was caught in the act of adultery, in flagrante delicto, as they say. Now, I'm already suspicious, because by definition, adultery is a sin that cannot be committed by yourself, right? Yep. So, where's the guy? And why isn't he standing there with her? He should be. If you're looking at the strict law of Moses, in the passages that talk about adultery, it talks about both, you know. So, there's a lot of speculation here. We know that this woman is being used. This is a trap. It makes sense to me that this adultery was arranged, shall we say? 
to be. You go in and you take one for the team here with this lady, and we'll just arrange to happen to drop by, you see, so that we can have eyewitnesses, so that we can bring this one. And then you just kind of quietly melt away. And would you be willing to do this? Sleep with somebody and get a free pass on it? Gee, that would be really a tough decision, right? So, and it shows you how much they care about this lady, right? Mm -hmm. These are the religious teachers and authorities, and they're going to use this poor woman for their own ends. What sweethearts, right? Mm -hmm. So, by the way, a lot of the, the passages I've read about this say that they caught this woman in the act she very well may have been standing there naked in front of everybody just to shame her even more. That doesn't surprise me. If, if that actually is the case, maybe they allowed her to throw a garment on. It doesn't say. But just to heighten things, that, that you know, we, we're talking about people that mean, you know. So here's the trap. They say to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, we're commanded to stone such women. What do you say? They said this to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. If Jesus says, yes, she has sinned she has committed adultery and according to the act the law of moses adultery is a capital crime so she deserves to die for this then number one he's lost his reputation as somebody who is kind and compassionate and number two he is immediately in trouble with the romans because the Romans have taken away the authority of the Jewish authorities to execute anybody. They're not allowed. That's why Jesus had to have two trials. First, they tried him in Jewish court. They convicted him. They said he's, he has to die, but they're not allowed to execute him. So they take him to Pilate and say, we've tried him. He is guilty according to our laws. Pilate basically says, I don't give two figs for your laws. And they have to try him all over again. So if Jesus says, yes, let's execute her, giving them permission to pick up stones that they probably already have in their hands. If you've ever been to Israel, my sister said once, I understand now why they stoned people. There's no lack of ammunition. <laughs> There are stones all over the place. So everybody, you know, then he's now an insurrectionist. He's now advocating against the law and authority of Rome. He's made himself a traitor, according to Roman laws. He's, a, he's a instigating mob violence, okay? And they can get rid of him that way. Or, if he says, no, don't stone her for her crime, then he's saying the law of Moses is wrong. And then he's lost his authority. You see, it's an ingenious trap, you know? This is the same trap they try to get him in when they say, hey, should we pay our taxes to Rome? No, again. You know, the same thing. Are you going to poke that bear that is there in the, the grinding between the Jewish laws and the Roman laws, where we all hate the Romans, but they're in charge, you know? Either way, they think they've got him. But Jesus doesn't fall into the trap. He does something very unusual. Here's another detail that makes me think that this is for real, because this detail is never explained. What does he do first? He bends down and writes in the dirt. This is the only instance we have of Jesus writing anything. And we 
don't know what he wrote. <laughs> and that's maddening, right? Don't you want to know? Do you have any theories? I have theories. Yes, thank you, Esther. So one theory is he does this to draw everybody's attention away from her, to give her a little bit of dignity. Another says, well, he's stalling for time. I don't believe that. The Greek word katagraphein means to write something down as in writing a record, recording something, um, or to write something in particular. This is not scribbling. He's not doodling. He's not making a design. He's not you know, just kind of moving the dirt around. He's writing something in particular. The two biggest theories are he's writing the names of the other men in the crowd who have committed adultery. Oh. 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 Yes. He would know. He would know. Or he's recording other sins, mm. you know, writing you know, somebody's name and a sin, something like that in the dirt. So he does that, whatever he writes, we don't know. Clearly we don't need to know, I want to know, but we don't need to know. And then, as they keep pressing him, he stands up and says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And then once more, he bent down and writes on the ground. A few more sins. Yeah. <laughs> Just in case. Just in case they didn't get the point. So it's brilliant because he never says, execute her. He never says, don't execute her. He says, if you're going to do this, this same standard's going to be applied to you. So those of you who are without sin, by all means, start throwing your stones. If you're gonna point out the speck in somebody else's eye, you better make sure you don't have a two by four in your own so that you can see clearly, right? It's not that we ignore the speck in somebody's eye. That's an important thing. If you've ever had one, you know it's a big deal. But before you go criticizing, make sure that you have a clear record. And I love the, uh, this other little detail that didn't have to be added. When they heard this, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. Because the older ones are wiser, right? Of course. Or have more sins. <laughs> <laughs> or have more sins. <laughs> or have more sins. Yeah, you can look at it either way. <laughs> Olivia likes that particular. <laughs> that was my first thought. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they know that they're beaten. But I just have to giggle to myself because they probably went home and their heads exploded, right? <laughs> we thought we had them. Oh, they were probably so mad. They were probably so furious. Oh, yeah. Steam coming out of their ears. Mm -hmm. But that's not the end of the story. We could end the story there, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not over yet. Because when they're all gone, we're left with Jesus and this woman. And remember how shocking it would be for Jesus... A, to talk to a woman that wasn't done. A woman he's not related to. Although he kind of is, you know. And that kind of woman, a fallen woman, right? Possibly a naked woman standing there. And he says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She looks around. I guess there's no one, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Go, Damn. and from now on, sin no more. Now there's so much theology in that one sentence. Because the only way 
that Jesus can say, I don't condemn you. I said he had the power to do it. Well, he had the power to do it, but to be a just God and say, I don't condemn you, because it is in the law of Moses. And it's actually a pretty big one. It made the top ten, right? Mm -hmm. Hear God's word, number seven. Marriages are made in heaven, said the Lord to Moses. Worship only me, I'll be yours eternally. <laughs> I learned that in Sunday school. That's how I learned the Ten Commandments. So, you know, it's one of the big ones. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Or as it was unfortunately printed in the bulletin when I was a kid, thou shalt commit adultery. <laughs> the guy sitting in front of me turned around and said, have we had a change of policy? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the only way, it, it's clear as a bell, the only way that Jesus can say, I don't condemn you, is because he came to earth to take her condemnation on himself. He was going to the cross to take that adultery for her on himself. That's the only way he can say, go, I do not condemn you. Because he's taking her sins upon himself. What an incredibly loving, compassionate, gracious, merciful God we have, right? Because if we're casting the parts in this play, we're all the woman standing there, right? And if we're honest, we're also the ones with the stones just waiting to throw them, right? And he says, I don't condemn you, but he doesn't stop, right? Because there's that next little piece that so often gets forgotten in the 21st century church. I don't condemn you, he says. And we go, yay! <laughs> and then he says, now. Leave your life of sin. Leave your life of sin. And we go, oh. <laughs> well, that's the hard part, yeah. right? Damn. And praise God, we can go back and hear, I don't condemn you, because we hear that every week, at least, in church, right? That's the assurance of pardon. Your sins are forgiven. Now go and live the life that he would have you live. You're going to fail. Come back and receive forgiveness again, and then go. It's a continual process, but hopefully, as we look back, we can see, I'm not who I should be, but I'm not who I was. I have grown in grace and holiness because Jesus is the God that he is. Thoughts, questions before I move on? Yes, sir. So um, when you said that um, that particular passage doesn't hold the same authority, what does that mean? Oh, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> it's be, because it's a disputed passage, because it doesn't, we can't trace it back to the oldest copies of John that we have. Okay. Uh, there's question doesn't belong in here. And so there are some people that, you know, it, it's got that asterisk next to it. It doesn't matter? I, for this, I don't think so. Like I said, I think this belongs I in the scripture. It, it just, it's got too much power to it, you know? And that's what the church... Where you enter it doesn't really matter. Right. You know, and most of the other disputed verses, like when we were back in chapter 5 and there were those couple verses that were put in the footnote that explained going into the pool and why they wanted that, that was no, deal, right. you know, yeah. eh, whatever, who cares, you know, but this is a pretty big one. Okay. Yes? So we know through the course of the years, early years, men had concubines, and they had multiple wives. Isn't that adultery in a way? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mm -hmm. mean, to me. If, if uh, when they asked Jesus to rule on 
the big hot potato question of the day, which is when is divorce okay and when is it not okay? He didn't wade into that. He gave the positive answer. Uh, look at what marriage is supposed to be. A man will leave his parents and cleave unto his wife and the two shall become one. That's the, that's how God designed it, you know. Um, you are allowed divorce because of the brokenness of our world and there are going to be circumstances when the two have become two, you know, rather than staying one, uh, as many of us in the room can, can testify. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you're just inviting problems. Well, that, I mean... The more wives you have, the more concubines, the more... Well, so how can they condemn her when, when they, men throughout time had been guilty of it? That's what I'm thinking. Well, are you daring to suggest that men and women are to be held to the same standard when it comes to sex? <laughs> Well, you're one of those radicals then, aren't you? You're one of those fundamentalists. Boys will be boys, Christine. Don't you know? Yeah, I'm not, but don't say anybody that I'm advocating for that, okay? I said that sarcastically. It's on tape, I said that sarcastically. And that's probably her manner of supporting herself. We're not told that, but it could be. Yeah, but I mean, look at some of these letters that 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 Paul wrote addressing this very thing, and then and I think Jesus specifically um, talked about it, right? So it's not yeah. that he was okaying it, or no. I mm -hmm. mean, it, a sin is a sin, whether you're a woman, a concubine, or a guy, or a high priest, or whatever. You're one of those radicals too, aren't you? <laughs> yes, yes, but we are very good at holding some people to standards that we don't hold other people to. And it's been every society just shuffles the categories as to who gets privileges and who doesn't. Yeah. We did basically the same thing with the woman at the well. Yeah. 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 And she By did. husbands, yeah. And, and the one you're with now. Well, it's not your husband. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm listening to this uh, book on CD. It's Brent Hansen, The Men We Need, which is fantastic. And he very specifically mentions this as far as a role model that for men. Um, but he said that this one, the woman in this passage was Samaritan. I think he got the two stories mixed up. Maybe, yeah. Because I didn't see that anywhere. Anymore. No, it's not. It, not in any any version I've seen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Could have mixed up. Yeah. So, well, let's keep going. And since the rest of the chapter is one big chunk, let's divide it in half. I need two readers. Sean, if you could read through verse. 38 and then Mike if you could pick up at verse 39 thank you again Jesus spoke to them saying I am the light of the world whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life so the Pharisees said to him you are bearing witness about yourself your testimony is not true Jesus answered even if I do bear witness about myself my testimony is true for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself. And the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, Therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. 
So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have so much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world that what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been sent, that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I, am, that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is, me, is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The sin does not remain, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, We were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father... You would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reasons why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. But I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. And the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jew said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. 
So we began with trying to throw stones at a woman, and now they're trying to throw stones at him. They didn't want to throw stones. They just like throwing stones all around. So a lot of the conversations and the discussions that we already saw in chapter 5 and chapter 7 are picked up here again with, you know, talking about who is Jesus, where does he come from, where is his authority, what is his relationship with his father in heaven, he begins by giving the second of the seven I am statements. I am the light of the world. And we're probably still at the Feast of Tabernacles. Probably the, the passage we just looked at interrupts that story uh, because it says here, the references to the light may indicate that it's still the Feast of Tabernacles and Jesus is still in Jerusalem. On the last day of the feast, the illumination of the temple was celebrated. The Torah scrolls were removed and replaced with a candlestick in an allusion to Proverbs 6.23, Psalm 119.105, and Isaiah 16, verse 1. I know Psalm 119.105 is... Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Um, this prayer would be offered on the occasion, O Lord of the universe, thou commanded us to light the lamps to thee, yet thou art the light of the world. So Jesus then stands up and says, I am the light of the world. So what is he saying? He's gone. Yep. Yep, and he's going to say that again throughout the passage. Now, light does three things for us. It illumines so that we can see where we are and where we're going. Um, it warms us in the cold. And it enables things to grow. So when Jesus says he is the light of the world, he is the the way that I, by which we see the way, his word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. He is our warmth of love in a cold world, and without him we cannot grow. Debbie, you have beautiful plants that you post all kinds of pictures about. They're, it's important the kind of light that they get, right? Can any of them grow in complete darkness? No. No. Your orchids would not do well. Mushrooms. Uh, they still need some light, don't they? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, whoever follows him, he says, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life all the way back in chapter 1. Those two things were linked together by John. Jesus came, um, he came as the light, and his light was the life of humankind, he said in chapter 1. Without his light, we cannot live. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Hark the herald angels sing, we sing that every every year so um, you know it's important that we don't walk in the darkness right it's important we follow the light one of the greatest compliments that Jesus ever gave to us was you are the light of the world God's light Jesus claims he is God, it's his light. Our light is a reflection of his. We don't have light ourselves. We're like the moon, right? Jesus is the sun. We're like the moon, we reflect the light that he gives to us so that others can see and believe and have life. The problem is we refuse to be the light, right? We hide it under a bushel. Do you remember the song, Olivia? <laughs> hide it under a bushel? No. No. Um, I'm going to let it shine. Yeah. <laughs> so he says this, and you know, 
look at all this that we got out of one verse there. And the Pharisees are like, whatever. <laughs> We're not going to listen because you're testifying about yourself. And, you know, you need two witnesses to establish the truth. Why should we believe you? You're just out there making all these claims with nothing to back them up. Yeah, you're the light of the world. Sure you are. Okay, fine. And Jesus gives a two-part answer. Number one, he says, even if I am testifying about myself, that doesn't diminish the truth. You know, it's still true. And number two, he says, I do have two witnesses, myself and my Father in heaven. Well, that brings the inevitable, where's your father? And am I the only one that sees in there those old lies that they told about Jesus, where some remembered they had long memories that Mary got pregnant a little too early? <laughs> And so there was a word they called Jesus that I can't use in good society. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. There's one place where they don't call him the son of Joseph. They call him the son of Mary, which means we don't know who your papa is. Uh, yeah. So can't help but read that between the lines. But they say, where is your father? They brace themselves for what they expect is the blasphemous answer, my father is in heaven. But Jesus doesn't press that button because it's not yet his time. And instead he answers, where is your father? Verse 19, he said, you don't know me and you don't know my father. If you knew me, you would know my father. And he says this, we're told near the temple treasury. Temple Treasury, they're not actually in the vault, by the way, where mm -hmm. the money is kept. It's the part of the temple where there were, I think, 17 different offering boxes that you could put your money in. And depending on which box, they were shaped like a trumpet, so they were called the trumpets. Depending on which box you put your money in was depending on which fund you were giving to. There was one that paid for the oil, the olive oil that went into the lamps. There was one that paid for um, the animals that were sacrificed. There was one that paid for repairs. You know, they had all these different funds. So he's standing in that area, and near this is where the four big menorahs were lit for the last day of the festival. Jesus is the light of the world. And nobody comes and arrests him, not this time, uh, for saying what he has said. And so he keeps on going. And he says, where I'm going, you can't follow. And we've got another classic situation of Jesus giving a deep spiritual teaching and everybody there completely missing what he's saying. They jump to the conclusion, is he going to kill himself and go to hell? Is that why we're not going to be able to follow where he's going? Yeah, that's what he's saying. Sure. Okay. And he stresses again, I'm from above, therefore he has authority, he has knowledge. He says, you're from below, you're going to die in your sins unless you believe in me. We come back to that theme that we've had over and over and over again in John, that when you know Jesus, by believing in Jesus, you have life in his name. He says at the end, this is written, that you may know and believe in Jesus and have life in his name. And so he says, you have to believe in me. And they say, who are you? And I love his answer. Basically, that's what I've been trying to tell you all along. <laughs> and you're not getting it. You're not paying attention. He says, but you will know me. And you will know that I am from the Father when I am lifted up. Which is code for 
crucified. crucified. Then you will know who I am and where I come from. I'm only doing what my father tells me to do. He says my father is always with me. And at this point, many believe. That's what the Holy Spirit. Absolutely, it has to be, yeah. But he doesn't stop there. He throws some gasoline on the fire. <laughs> Yeah, verses 31. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I have found this to be, I think, perhaps one of the most profound things that Jesus says. Life comes, again, through faith in Jesus Christ. That means abiding in his word like we are doing now, studying his word. The more we know him, the more we know his word, the more we know the truth, the more we are set free from the binding and the lies that bind us up here in this world. Um, when we, the, the more we know Jesus, the more we know who we are, and the more we can recognize the lies that the devil tells us. He's still using the same ones over and over again. Did God really say don't eat that fruit? Did God really say no sex unless you're married? Did God really say whatever, you know? He did. Yes, he did. <laughs> um, and, and, and even in smaller, lesser ways, I found over and over again, um, knowing who God is, and therefore knowing who we are in Him, breaks so many bonds. Because if you've been told from the time you're young that you are worthless, you are a waste of space. You are never going to amount to anything. You are ugly. You are stupid. You are whatever. And some of you I know were told that. And you believed it. Because you do, right? We believe those lies. And what does that do to you? If you believe the lie, you live according to the lie. And if you think you're worthless and a waste of space and you're never going to amount to anything and you're ugly and you're stupid and nobody's going to love you, then you're not going to value your life very much, are you? And you're going to start looking for validation and love and acceptance in all the wrong places. And I'm not pointing any fingers because this is every single one of us in this room, right? We've done something where we were looking for love and validation and acceptance in all the wrong places. When you know the truth, you were created in the image of God. You specifically were created to reflect the grace and the grandeur and the splendor and the beauty and the power of God and you are that valuable just because God says you're that valuable not by what anyone else says to you not by what you can give to society not how you can make somebody else feel good but just simply in who you are and you're valuable and you are important and God loves you oh my goodness what a difference that makes right then I'm not going to live for everyone else's approval. Any of you ever tried to live that way? To keep everybody else happy? It's not a happy way to live, is it? Because it's a moving target, right? It always is changing what you have to do to gain that approval. And if you're going to feel, oh, I know what will make me feel good. I'll get in this relationship and then my life is going to be perfect now, right? <laughs> Oh, how stupid we were when we were teenagers, right? But he said he loved me. <laughs> of course he did. Yeah. Or this chemical will 
fix all of my problems and make me feel good, right? Or this job, finally I will have arrived because I have this job, and that means I'm a respectable and important person. And then it doesn't, right? And nothing else. It's the truth that sets you free. I could go on preaching, but <laughs> we got the rest of the passage. I just, that, that principle is so important, I think. And that's why we need to be out there shining the light. Because <clears throat> there's so many who are bound up by lies. And where do they come from? Where did Jesus say they come from, those lies? He's the, a liar and the father of lies. Yeah. So you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free from the lies of the devil. And they say to him, ha, huh, what do you mean set free? We're children of Abraham. We don't need to be set free. We've never been slaves. Of course you haven't. And Jesus says, uh, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And ain't that the truth? Pretty soon your sins begin to own you until you can be delivered from them by the truth of Jesus Christ. Paul expands on that a lot. And we underplay that so much. We, th we think we can manage sin, right? <laughs> oh, a little bit isn't going to hurt me. Ah. Go read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. That's a whole meditation. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jekyll thought, I can play around with this Mr. Hyde thing, which stands for evil mm -hmm. and sin all the things you shouldn't do. I, I can do a little bit, and I can indulge a little bit, and I can have fun with it, and then before he knows it, he's turning into Mr. Hyde, whether he wants to or not. And it ends up taking him over. That's what evil does. So, however he says, if you, know, if you commit sin, you are a slave to sin, but the, and the slave doesn't remain in the household forever. It's the son who remains forever. So if the son, Jesus, sets you free, you will be free indeed. And Paul goes on to say he will have you adopted so that you are sons and daughters within the household and no longer slaves. And you can't be cast out then because you belong. I'm telling you this, you're claiming to be offspring of Abraham, yet you're trying to kill me, so you're really not offspring of Abraham. He says, you are children of your own father, the devil. Here's where they really get mad. Because <laughs> he calls them children of the devil. And I don't know about you, but I don't find that very flattering. <laughs> They say Abraham is our father, you know? Father Abraham is the father of all the Jews. All of those who believe, he says, if you truly were, Ab if you were Abraham's children, you'd do the works that Abraham did, and you're not. You're trying to kill me for telling you the truth, which I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You're doing the works your father did. They said we were not born of sexual immorality we're not bastards we have one father god's our father jesus says if god were your father you would love me for i come from god and i am here not of my own accord he sent me why do you not understand what i say it's because you cannot bear to hear my word you are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires he was a murderer from the beginning and it has nothing to do with the truth. There's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Go all the way back to Cain and Abel. That's because of the influence of Satan. Go all the way back to the serpent in the garden. He lied from the very beginning. Did God really say, you will not surely die? God's trying to hold you back. God's trying to keep you from having something good. God's trying to keep you down. Uh-huh. So, kick him to the curb. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walketh about like a roaring lion, seeing whom he may devour. To re uh, resist him, and he will flee from you. 
So then we get to the really mature part of the exchange. Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and you have a demon? <laughs> You're just a big duty head, Jesus. <laughs> you're, a, you're just stupid. You're, you're demon possessed. You're, you're a terrible thing. And I would have walked away right there. But Jesus, no, that's not who I am. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. This is where their heads explode yet again. <laughs> Because they're saying, uh, Abraham died, the prophets died. Are you saying you're greater than Abraham and the prophets? Yeah, that's what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. And he says, look, I'm not here to promote myself. I've been sent by my father. He says that over and over again. I'm sh he's showing his true glory to the world. You don't know him, I do. And Abraham rejoiced to look ahead and see this day that you are living right now. Because Abraham was made the promise, right? Through him and his descendants, the whole world will be blessed. That day is being fulfilled right here and now, Jesus says. Through me, the whole world will be blessed. Through me, the true child of Abraham, if you believe in me and accept me, sent by the Father, you will have life and light, and you will not die. And they say, what are you talking about? You're not even 50 years old yet. What do you mean you've seen Abraham? You know what Abraham did. And here's the real flashpoint. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, the grammar is really important there. And it's particularly written this way. It's not before Abraham was, I was. He's not just saying he's old. He's calling himself God. The name of God, I am, Yahweh, in the Hebrew. Before Abraham was, God, he say. And they pick up stones. But again, he escapes arrest and execution because it's not yet his time. You see how things are executing here. How many years after Abraham died are we talking? Probably um, David was about the year 1000. Moses was about the year 1400. Probably at least 2000 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, different people dispute, but about 2,000 years or more, yeah. So quite a bit, yeah. So he's saying he's God. The key is, do you believe in him? If you do, you will have light and life. You will be set free. You will become a child of God. You will have a place in the house. You will have freedom, and upon the rock of faith like this, Jesus builds his church. I mean, this, this whole idea of identity, you can't help but think of Matthew 16, where Jesus looks at the disciples and says, all right, who do you say I am? It's come down to this. This is the question everyone has to answer. Who is Jesus? And C.S. Lewis famously said, you've only got three options, because he said he was God. You can't call him a good teacher. You can't call him a nice guy. Who is he? He says he's God. Who do you say he is? He's either a liar. He said he was God, but he knew he wasn't. Or he's a lunatic. He really believed he was God, but he wasn't. Or he's the Lord. Those are your only choices. Liar, lunatic, or Lord. Who is he? Who do you say he is? And he's throwing this in everybody's face here, and some people believe, and a lot. And we're going to have a showdown again next week, the Monday after Thanksgiving, because Jesus is going to do something that no one had ever seen before. He's going to heal a blind man who was blind from birth, that had 
never been done in all of Scripture. That even the, the people who claim to be healers in Jesus' day, they might heal somebody who, you know, had cataracts. They had seen before and couldn't see now. But nobody had ever healed somebody who was blind from birth. And Jesus does it. And the Pharisees can't stand it. <laughs> because only God could do something like that. So we're going to have a showdown. Do you really believe that he is blind? Some did. And so it, it's pretty hard to deny. Uh, how else do you explain? Exactly. All the yeah. things he's already done. Yeah. And, and they're going to tie themselves up in knots to not believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh, in verse 33, they answer, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. They've been enslaved? E e Egypt? Uh -huh. oh, yeah. The Romans? So, yeah. How can they not say they haven't been enslaved? Not them, though. Maybe their ancestors. ancestors. But they're certainly not living in great freedom. Yeah, I mean, they might not technically be slaves, but they're, they're not living in the greatest of freedom. You, you can see how easily we deceive ourselves. Oh, yeah, I have to come to you to be set free. Sure. I mean, aren't they looking for the Messiah even at this time, or have they just decided? No, nope, there were all kinds of people who claim to be the Messiah in the previous centuries and even after Jesus, yeah. I don't know. I think but he's not the kind of Messiah they were looking they were for. Looking for. They were looking for someone to come in and kick roads, but... Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, what else could we possibly need? Yeah. We're good people. And we can take care of everything else. <laughs> yeah. You just got to get them out of here. Yeah. The yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's, John is, is very good at recognizing human nature. Yeah. Other questions or thoughts? Well, let's close with prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. Thank you that we have been set free by your son, and so we are free indeed. Thank you for the light and the life that you give to us. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness grace that we have through you. We pray that you would help us to truly be thankful throughout these weeks and to shine your light and gather us together again next week in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys.